So hello, welcome. We've got another Ken Seven podcast, and joining me is the uh, I don't know the former lead singer of Star Sailor, or well, maybe I should just say joining me is James Walsh, who was the lead singer of Star Sailor. James, thanks very much for joining me. How are you doing? You're right. I'm good. Yeah, yeah. Um, the ba- the band is still a a going concern. We we. Ah. We're a lot. I can understand why you why you would think that because we're a lot quieter than we were um, in the early days when it was non-stop. Yeah. Um, but we have done the odd sort of gig and um, uh, release stuff every now and again over the last few years. So uh, yeah, we're um, we're still in touch and we're still kind of we still well, get good. together and do stuff. So well, yeah, we'll get, we'll I thought. Get in. I'd, We'll get yeah. into that, right? So obviously primarily we're a Liverpool podcast, although I'm massively into music. So to have you on is brilliant. I get to talk music with someone who's mm-hmm. into music, you know. But um, let's deal with the Liverpool stuff first. So, yeah. you know, my, my first point is, you know, how how did you become a Liverpool fan? How, where, where does that come from? Um, well, I grew up in Chorley in Lancashire. Yeah. And... Um, it was pre kind of Blackburn and even sort of Preston to a lesser extent, kind of basically doing a bit better and being the team to support. So everyone in my school pretty much supported either United or Liverpool. Um, and my mates and my older brother um, all supported Liverpool, or, mo- or most of them anyway. Um, Liverpool were doing quite well at the time, the sort of late 80s, early 90s when I started supporting. Um, and yeah, I wish it was I wish it was a more kind of romantic story of like uh, my dad was a Liverpool fan, his dad was a Liverpool fan, his dad was a Liverpool fan, but uh, no, it was uh, there weren't that that many choices really. And then it's it's a weird kind of I don't know, like a backward sort of glory hunting thing where (laughs) a lot of the fans who had started supporting Liverpool immediately jumped ship to Blackburn when, including my brother, (laughs) when, when, (laughs) uh, when Kenny moved and Jack Walker took over and I thought, no, despite the fact that we weren't doing particularly well under, um, Graham Souness, um, I'm going to stick to my guns. I've I, I picked Liverpool, and and that's it. I've got to I've got to stand by my choice. <laughs> I mean, I, I I don't know whether uh, you said it was a romantic story there. If you you go if if you you say, well, my dad was a fan, and my granddad was a fan, but it's not because that's just bullying. They don't give you yeah. a choice <laughs> in that option. At least yeah. you had a choice yeah. and chose right. I had no yeah. choice at all, and my dad took me, me to my first game when I was two. Right. Um, yeah, and I, f- I was asleep the yeah. whole game. Apparently, he said I woke up when we yeah. scored. So, um, you know, that's, uh, there's nothing romantic about that. <laughs> yeah, my dad. I, I say that uh, my sort of my dad wasn't a fan. My granddad wasn't a fan. My my dad does kind of profess to be a, a Liverpool fan, but it certainly wasn't sort of drummed drummed, in, drummed right. into us from a, an early age. Um, so what are you? Yes. What, what what are you like uh, in terms of like being a, a, a fan? I mean, how would you describe yourself? I'm, I'm, I'm what I was thinking when I was trying to formulate this question was, what are you like on a match day? Because I'm like I, the day before, I'm thinking about the game and I'm thinking, oh, I've got a game to watch. You know, even when we're rubbish, I'm looking forward to watching a game. How, what what yeah. about you? How does it work for you? Um. Yeah, I'm, I'm always I'm quite an optimistic fan, and. Uh, no matter how we're performing, I always think maybe this is the <laughs> maybe this is the game where we turn it around. Um, but yeah, I get excited on a on a match day, and uh, I do enjoy kind of um, obviously like following your podcast and the lads on the Anfield rap. And yeah, I think like like I was I was saying earlier um, before we kind of started the interview. I feel like the the kind of fan podcasts and websites and message boards or uh, Twitter and wherever fans kind of interact 
it always becomes that bit more animated when things are a bit fraught and things are a bit um aren't going so well like they are at the moment because it's almost like a form of therapy where yeah um everyone's got their everyone's got their kind of theories on what's going wrong and and how long term it is and it's nice to kind of hear from people when you're feeling a bit doom and gloom about it all hear from people who are like no this is a short term yeah issue and and we're in the right place and we're moving in the right direction and we've just got to weather this storm and well you I mean you mentioned yeah. them there I mean the Anfield Rat Boys uh they they sort me out when my head's gone yeah. totally I, I <laughs> yeah. wait their, their podcast come out the post-game podcast and if something's gone wrong I can't listen yeah. to if something's gone wrong I can't listen to the post-game podcast podcast straight away give me yeah. a couple of days but then once I do that and then listen to the review then yeah. I start going, ah, okay, well, I can see, uh, yeah. And I mean, are you the same? Does that does it work like that for you? Yeah. 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 I think uh, some of the, like, uh, Neil's post match reviews are quite funny as well and quite yeah. sort of well, well written. It's kind of David Peace, remind me, reminds me of his sort of writing. So <laughs> yeah, it's good. <laughs> no, he's, 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 He's just very matter of fact, Neil. They're all mm. they're all really good. Like I've had, uh, I've spoke to lucky enough to get Gareth on here and mm. John Gibbons. I've been, I've I've had on a few times, and they're yeah. just they're just good lads. You know, what I mean, nothing's too much yeah. trouble for them. They've been uh, they're brilliant. And then, like I say, that it's it's like therapy. They 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 talk you round. But I mean, yeah. like you say, Twitter in particular is very <laughs> toxic, and yeah. there's no there's no level ground. It's either awful yeah or we're the best thing in the universe you know what i yeah. mean and and you get all of those opinions you have to just rub, shrug your shoulders i mean does, does, what looking at those sort of comments especially the toxic ones that does that does that annoy you how do you feel about it um yeah definitely I, yeah i think i find like the not just with football but with everything it's like the older the older i get the more it's in some kind of uh, contradiction. <laughs> the more sure I am of my opinions and my kind of worldview, but also the more sensitive I am to people who challenge that, or e- even in a sort of, even in a ridiculous way where, it, it, like you say, it's toxic, it still kind of gets to you a bit and you think, oh, that's sort of. <laughs> I don't know that I've got a thick enough skin to just get on there and be like, "Bah, this is what I think." And yeah, um, yeah, because when people sort of bite back, it's like, "Oh, that's <laughs> could do without that." Or something. Yeah, I think I think sometimes I feel very defensive of my club. Sometimes when yeah. people have that opinion, and it's their club as well. But I, yeah. I get very like, no, don't be saying that. You know, these lads are, are great. You know, they've, they've what yeah. they've done for us and all that. It's difficult to 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 level it out in your mind, I think. But just you know, just look at the season we've had. I know obviously it's not been what we wanted. Um, you know, how how do you assess what's gone on there? Um, I don't know where do, where do you start. <laughs> where obviously, do you start? Obviously, uh, losing Van Dyke, I think, was a massive blow. Hmm. Um, but we coped he, without Van Dyke for a while, for a good while. I mean, we yeah. were top of the league at Christmas. Yeah, but yeah. It's almost we we lost Matip as well at that point. I mean, we we yeah. coped without Van Dyke and Gomez for a, quite a while, but then yeah. I think almost like mentally, when they lost Matip, it was yeah. oh, you know, what are we going to do? What are we going to do now? Playing so many games without any recognised central defenders, it's like, no, that's, yeah. And people talk about, well, um, City have had to cope without this player or that player. Um, But when they've lost key players in defence in the past, they fell apart as well. Last season, they lost Laporte and had to put Fernandinho back there and it didn't work. Yeah, so it's. Uh, I think it's definitely a big factor, and and the pressure of winning it last mm. season, and the fans playing such a massive part in that as well, and them suddenly being gone. Mm. Um, 
Yeah. No one, no one can tell me that we lose six games at home on the bounce in a full stadium. No, it's just not happening. No. no, no, it's not happening. So the, I mean, it is a factor, and I've had I've had a lot of people say the fans, and I'll always counter it by going, "Well, the fans haven't affected Man City." Um, yeah. But when you get freak results like those six, it certainly yeah. tells you something. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Completely. Um, and the, I think the the kind of lack of confidence, up, obviously Salah's still banging them in, but the lack of confidence up front as well. Um, and that's another thing that the fans would have, you look at how Mane struggled recently. The fans would have been right behind him, mm, and really yeah. g'ing him up and getting him going. And I don't know. I don't want to make assumptions on how how he ticks. And Firmino mm. as well is a another player who thrives off that um, reaction. Mm. Um, I don't want to make assumptions on what's going on in their heads or uh, what makes them tick, but that could well be a factor. I mean you you can you can compare it to your your game and and yeah how would you feel about playing in the MEN arena with no one in there yeah. doing a live stream in the MEN arena on a stage. Yeah. You wouldn't it it wouldn't it wouldn't feel right. It would it wouldn't you would you would be you you know when you go on stage you get that extra ten percent don't you? Yeah when you hear yeah. people singing back and stuff like that. So, I mean, it's exactly the same. Do you, do you agree with that? Yeah, well, I, th- I think a good example of that is like doing streamed mm. gigs or doing live streams where when you're playing live and something goes wrong, you can, it's obviously nerve wracking, but if you've got a good crowd behind you, you they keep encouraging you and they, they stay with you. Mm. Whereas when you're doing a live stream, you might get the odd encouraging comment, like you know, when like the the stream goes a bit wonky or whatever. You get the odd encouraging comment, but otherwise you kind of feel lost, and you're like, "Oh, this is all this whole thing's unraveling." And um, <laughs> I get that. And may, maybe there's maybe there's a bit of that with the players where they make a mistake, and you think, "Fuck, this is sorry for swearing." They think. Oh. <laughs> they think uh, <laughs> They think, oh no, this is um, it, this is all going wrong, and because there isn't the the crowd there to kind of keep them to get them up again to go, no, we're still behind you, keep keep fighting, keep at it. it yeah. The whole thing just kind of, and I, like I know they're kind of professional athletes, and they they should obviously be able to um, to do that on their own without any crowd in the stadium but it's bound to to have an have a an effect i think mm. just before we we move on to music i just wanted to get a, a get a brief comment off you on what you thought about the european super league um while it was all going on and 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 everything <laughs> um i'm glad it's not happening now i think uh, like most people um although there must be some people in football and and in who are fans of football who would have supported something like that. Otherwise, how do sort of top businessmen who've made billion, millions, if not billions of pounds, decide that that might be a good idea? It's like somebody somewhere wants it and wanted it. Um, but yeah, for in terms of Liverpool being a club for the community and also a club that's prided itself on being the best on on merit on uh, yes yeah. yeah, especially when Shankly took over and, and took us from a second division team to winning FA Cups and winning leagues left right and centre and um, then the Super League kind of like a lot of the fans have said goes completely against that mm. the, the, the one thing I will say is that and this is kind of going off topic slightly and a bit political, <laughs> but I think uh, <laughs> it'd be nice if people who held that view about football, of socialism and and of a club being part of the community and to be protected at all costs, um, 
it'd be nice if people held that view about the health service and about the mm-hmm. arts and and thought beyond the dog eat dog yeah uh, capitalist culture whereas i feel like some people are like let's protect football at all costs but let everything else kind of yeah the the survival of the fittest kind of thing where where it's like no let's look at everything and and make everything work for the communities that that need it really well there was an Sorry. interesting parallel with the the race yeah, my, campaign my, yeah, 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 on your box box, a bit there. yeah. <laughs> no, but there's an interesting parallel with, you know with the racism campaign and and you know that's yeah. been, been done but the reaction wasn't anywhere as fervent as as it was for the, for the European yeah. Super League, and uh, that must be a frustration for the people who run in those campaigns, I'm sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Patrick Bamford said that when he came out yeah. um, after the Leeds game, and that that's another thing that's annoyed me as well. Is not not his comments; they were they were really good, and um, like you say, made a lot of sense, but. The club's kind of coming out and getting on their high horse about yeah. uh, um, when I think everyone, it, especially West Ham, if West Ham were invited to that, they'd jump at the chance. Yeah. So. Well, the, I think on Monday Night Football, they had the, the Crystal Palace chairman on and Jamie Carragher sat there and he come on being all high and mighty and Jamie Carragher went, yeah. well, let's go back to the fact that when the pandemic hit, you tried to use that as a way of null and void in the league so that you weren't at risk yeah. of relegation. And he glossed yeah. over it, he didn't respond. Yeah. Yeah. He, he started talking about something else, like his, his, what he had for tea or something. You know, it was it. it's an interesting point. Um, I think self, make... self-interest. Yeah. Yeah, self-interest. Most clubs, really. Um and yes, yeah, it's, it's just different kinds of self-interest, and and maybe the Super League was just the the other things that we've we've kind of grown up with and accepted, like the TV influence, the um, like loads of owners of football clubs that maybe aren't the most moral people. <laughs> maybe the Super League was just the tip of the iceberg yeah. where people finally woke up and went. Now this is too far. Yeah, <laughs> all the other things we can we we've can learned to live with and accept. But yeah. yeah, I mean, if you think about it, the the main I think the main problem that people had was the the lack of competition. So the no promotion, no relegation for the twelve clubs. Um, which, yeah. if you think about it as a football fan, that I'm sure the owners thought they'll be they're going to be made up. There's going to be yeah. no risk. Going to be in it every year. We don't have that whole yeah. stress of trying to qualify, and if you don't, you miss out. Mm. And the, the fans will be will be delighted, but it doesn't work yeah. like that because you know, as as much as we hate the lows, we yeah. love the highs, and you don't get one without the other. So yeah. you know, we played Newcastle the other day, and like you said, full of hope. Yeah, we, they, we'll do yeah. this, and we'll go two points ahead of the you know uh, Chelsea yeah. and West Ham, and then we don't do it, and you feel like yeah. utter shit. Um, yeah. but you know that's that's football that's why we love it so much isn't it yeah I think this season especially the last few games is kind of as our um, <laughs> long term or not long term medium term goals of like winning the Champions League or, yeah. qual- or even qualifying for the Champions League if they've started to ebb away it reminds me of supporting Liverpool in the kind of mid-90s or early 90s when we would regularly finish 7th and 8th and you took each game by game and you think, oh, we've won today, that's great. And you're not even looking at what it means to the bigger picture because there isn't a bigger there picture. A bigger picture. Just, by this stage of the season, the beginning you hope for, <laughs> the beginning of the season, you're really yeah. hopeful. But by this yeah. stage of the season, it's just a, an acceptance that nothing's going to happen, yeah. I get that. We yeah. we said. We, I mean, you you just brought it up. We said before we started, didn't we? The game on Saturday reminded me of the, the time when we were close. We were under Roy Evans yeah. and David Roy James Evans. clapping yeah. at crosses yeah. every, every every week, you know. And we were the Coventry yeah. game where we lost two ga- two goals in the last five minutes. Just reminded. That's how I felt then, and I was young, a young yeah. man then. I'm an old man now, and I still felt yeah. the same way. If you're enjoying this video so far. Please show your support for the Ken 7 channel by subscribing, clicking the like button and also clicking the notifications button as well to get future broadcasts. 
If you could also share the video on your Twitter and Facebook account, that will show YouTube's algorithm that you like our content. Have you heard about Ken7 merchandise? The link is in the description of this video. We have premium fanware for fans covering Liverpool, Celtic and Scotland. And it's fanware for young and old. So we have t-shirts, hoodies, sweatshirts, caps, mugs, you name it, we've got it. Just something else to remember, every purchase that is made on our website, we donate to the Marina Dalgalish Appeal. So you're helping a great cause as well. Let's have a chat about music because yeah. um, you've... You've just released a single, but it's off the back of an album, isn't it, called Small Illusions, which you which yeah, you released yeah. in February. It's a solo album. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, what is that what you've been doing with your time during lockdown, a, a lot of writing and using it productively? Um, yeah, yeah, I've been uh, writing most days, really. I think, uh, like I say, you kind of wake up every day and feel a bit lost because there isn't... Um, there aren't gigs happening and mm. um, the music industry and world has kind of slowed down a little bit. Uh, so you can, I feel sort of feel like more my own boss in a way where I'm writing and recording in my own time. And uh, yeah, hopefully these kind of songs will do something, but the main thing is that they've, kept me occupied and given me something to do this this year is um 20 years since the star sailor album love is here mm -hmm. i've so made that was... note as well by the way i've actually <laughs> got that note <laughs> so the original plan was that it was going to be quite busy with um activity kind of surrounding that mm. um which is still happening later in the year um, but I think as that's been pushed back and back, I've had that, used that as an opportunity to to do more solo stuff and yeah, um, yeah, just. And a quick look going. through your YouTube channel, <clears throat> and obviously, um, you, 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 I mean, you looks like you've been really busy <laughs> in lockdown. There's loads of videos yeah. of you that on there. Obviously, I'm guessing you did some streams earlier on in. In, when yeah, the pandemic yeah. hit and and then you've done some really cool covers to them that i really liked was um love will never tear us apart yeah uh i love that song anyway and also the book of love by is it peter yeah. gabriel um originally by a magnetic fields but right. peter gabriel did a an amazing it's the peter version gabriel version that i know because i've sang that yeah. at a gig someone requested it um yeah. and i found it yeah it was quite a steep learning code but what an amazing song so i mean have you enjoyed mm -hmm. that part of it um yeah yeah i think uh, it's always a double-edged sword with with covers when you're songwriter and us um kind of made my name with the band or whatever mm -hmm. some people really like it and enjoy hearing me my interpretations of the songs and some mm -hmm. people like now get back to doing your own stuff and writing your own stuff. Um, I think it's just, uh, yeah, it kind of, uh, it's good for sort of catching people's ear who might not be a fan of the band who randomly come across a, a cover and that's that's their introduction to, mm -hmm. to the rest of the stuff I do. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's hard to kind of, uh, describe it in any more artistic or gra grandiose terms when it's just like I say you kind of get up every day and think well there's nothing pressing in the diary so what am I going to do yeah I'll just learn another song yeah. <laughs> post it online and see what happens and I get that I totally it's, get that it's nice yeah it's nice to get the feedback as well you kind of without again like without the ability to go out and play gigs and <clears throat> be reminded of that people like you and people like your music then online is the other way of yeah of getting that because i think artists uh this contradiction of massive insecurity and massive ego where um it only takes one video that doesn't get very many comments or likes or 
one gig that not very well attended and you think well that's it no one likes me that's the yeah. it's the end of the world no, and I then next it. week you next week you play a packed out gig and it could only be like a 30 capacity venue and you're like yes yeah, back they're the best ones <laughs> yeah, yeah. the small ones where it's yeah, it's a little yeah. tight room or all where yeah. everyone's on top of you i think they're yeah. the best do you know what i mean yeah yeah. Um, you you feel like you're one unit, everyone together, all mm -hmm. enjoying the same experience. So I got, totally get that. Yeah, I'm sure it's the same for most people. Though, if you if you run a cafe and you have a day where you're rushed off your feet, and then a day where no one comes in, you probably think oh, I'm useless at this. I'm not, <laughs> no one like no one likes our coffee and. The pastries are all stale and I might as well give up. So, <laughs> so what I was going to ask you, um, obviously, seen, in your career in the music industry, you've seen a lot of changes. So what I'm talking about there, obvi the obvious one is the advent of streaming and yeah. the accessibility of, of music digitally. But the other one, which sort of goes hand in hand with that, is that back in, in the day when you were releasing Love Is Here, you would have... You would have gone to, you would have written songs, probably done some demos, and then you'd have gone to an ex, uh, a studio to record it expensively. Now I'm sure that that version of the process is still valid, but mm. with the advent of people having studios in the home where you've just got literally a computer and some maybe a little dummy keyboard like that one behind me, and you can do all yeah. sorts of stuff on that, has that changed the industry for the better? Because a lot more people, and then also you don't need a record company to get your music out. There's mm. all sorts of platforms you can do it yourself. Tune call, yeah. pay forty nine quid, bang. There's your you're on iTunes, Spotify. Yeah. Has that helped, or has that hindered the industry? Um, Have you even thought about it, James? <laughs> uh, I, don't, I think probably a bit of both, really. Yeah, just to kind of sit on the fence there. <laughs> I don't think that's I think it's answer. yeah. I think it's it's great that, like you're saying, it's definitely benefited me that because that's literally what I've done is like recorded these songs on my own at home, gone on um, CD Baby and and set up a release, and I love that freedom and I love that um, that kind of. Uh, simple process really whereas like you say in the old days you'd record songs and wait nervously to see if a label would pick them up or yeah. or even with our own label um there's always a chance that a band will believe in a set of songs that they've written and then the label goes now nah, we that's not there's no singles there or so in that respect i think it's good that and it makes the the audience, the A&Rs, then they're the people who go yay or nay. Yeah. Um, but I think the downside to that is the sheer volume of yeah. content, of yeah. songs coming out and albums coming out. Um, there's no gatekeepers anymore. There's no labels or platforms to go, this is, um, this is what you should be listening to there's no enemy either there's no well there are they're online and they kind of uh, but do you think, you think that, was a good, or... that was a good thing to have i mean it, there's there's many many incredible songs in history where a record company has said and the first one that springs to mind is bohemian rhapsody hmm. where the record company went oh no no, 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 no. It's too long. It's weird. What are you doing? Um, and, you know, Queen have stuck to the guns. And basically, obviously, at that point, had a bit of power so that they could do it. But, you know, do you think that because the, the, the companies don't have the power anymore and people can release the music, that's, I would, I would say that's a good thing. That you, yeah, it's your choice as a listener to to. I mean, I, I think I think the only problem is the volume of stuff. I very very rarely listen to an album back to back now. Yeah, you, you just don't. It doesn't work like that. Whereas back in the day, you did. You'd have a CD and you put it in. And Christ, I sound so old, but um, yeah. I mean, I I get what you're saying about the filter. Do you what would you what would you say to that? Um, 
I don't know. I think it's just a shame that uh, shows like Top of the Pops aren't around anymore. And oh, um, yeah, totally. later, later with Jules Holland is. I think it's still going, but it's it not got the. It's not got the influence that it had. It's not the kind of mm. appointment viewing that it used to be. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I don't know. Obviously, like places like the NME and Q and labels, particularly cooler kind of indie labels, had a massive influence on what became popular. And um, sometimes that was good. Sometimes they championed a band um, and kept banging the drum of a band who maybe aren't as aren't necessarily immediately accessible, mm. but because particularly young people are more impressionable and, and want to want to get something that everyone's saying this is great, it's, and sudden and so they persevere with it, and then eventually they get it, and they're like, yeah. yeah Joy Division were worth persevering with, yeah. um, the Stone Roses even. Yeah. Whereas now it feels like without those uh, kind of guides, it's the most accessible music that's rising to the top rather than maybe the stuff with the most artistic merit. Okay. But that makes me, makes me sound a bit snobbish. But no, no, no. I, 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 I want totally to get where you're coming from now. I, I get where you're coming from <laughs> completely. Uh, we want to li we want to kind of live in a world where there's a place for for all that stuff. It's like yeah. all that like the sea shanty craze. It's like there's there's nothing wrong with that in of its own kind of thing and people enjoy it and it's great. But it shouldn't overshadow or or dictate kind of music and, and what labels are signing and um, where it's going. It's, it's, it's gone a bit too far in that direction where pe people are, it used to be that, it used to be that the labels led, in fact, I'm going <laughs> to try and try and uh, make some sense of the thoughts in my head. Um, <laughs> it's, it used to be that labels led trends and led um, where music was going to an extent. And they obviously made mistakes and messed things up. And now it's the public who are doing that, who are saying like they're watching someone doing a sea shanty five million times. Time. So a label's going, we've got to sign that. That's where music's going. Yeah. And I think there are... I'm back on the fence now. It's like there are upside downsides yep. to there are there are idiots at record labels and there are idiots in the general public. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yes. No, <laughs> completely agree with that. Um yeah. what I wanted to ask you was when you, you and the boys got together in, in the band. Yeah. Yeah. You obviously usually bands have similar influences and you, you like the same music and you become a band and then you write that music that stuff that that pleases yeah. you what what were your influences generally in the in, in the band um jeff buckley uh i grew up with brit pop so oasis blur yeah. pulp mm -hmm. um all, all those bands were a massive influence watching the verve at hay hall mm. that was a big moment for me mm. probably the, the the moment where i thought yeah i want to I want to take this seriously and, and and kind of form a band and yeah and do it for a living. Um, yeah, it's it's weird to look back on those years where um was so sure that it's what I wanted to do and it felt so normal and legitimate to me. And now I'm a bit older. I think my mum and dad must have been <laughs> must have thought I was mad. Yeah, no, <laughs> I I understand that completely that at the time I was, yeah at the time i'm like 17 18 and going well i'm gonna be in a big band and that's that's my kind of destiny or whatever or whatever cheesy words i was using and i was annoyed that they weren't like well of course you are yeah we'll, we'll 
well, uh, it, to be fair, they were very encouraging, but they were like, make sure you don't, don't put, don't get your hopes up. I was like, <laughs> I, like I am going to get my. That's such a British opinion. Like if you, if that was an American <laughs> family, they'd be go, follow your dream, go for it. You know, you can achieve anything. And Brits are like, yeah, it's probably not going to happen, but give it a good go. You'll be all right. Yeah. Yeah. They, 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 they've always, like I say, they've been very encouraging, but they were maybe like, don't put all your eggs in, into one <laughs> yeah. basket. That's another, another one. Yeah. Um, and now I'm a bit older. And I, I think, yeah, that, that probably was a crazy, <laughs> crazy thing to kind of, Completely stamp stamp my foot over yeah and it's just it's mad um it's just madness that it actually worked out and uh, yeah. i feel incredibly lucky that yeah i'm one of the one percent who said i'm going to be in a big band and make it in music and it actually happened <laughs> yeah. yeah oh brilliant well listen it's been lovely to talk to you james thanks very Cheers much to you appreciate too. it and wh where can people go and buy your the album um, it's on all the usual streaming yeah. platforms. Um, there's some uh, CDs and T-shirts and stuff at the t-shirtsshop.com. Um, and I've got a new song coming out called Bird in the Garden, which you can pre-save on Spotify now. Every, everything's on my Instagram and yeah. Twitter pages anyway. Lovely. Oh, well, listen, thanks very much, mate. Um, appreciate you. Cheers. To you. If you watch this on YouTube, just uh, click the subscribe button and uh, give the video a like. And uh, we'll see you again soon. We'll have some more content the rest of the week. Thanks very much for watching. Cheers.